Hi, I'm Mark Horowitz, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be talking about how to do the design of digital integrated circuits, and in particular, how to worry about and analyze power, which, as Jared Zerbe said earlier in the day, is a critical thing for integrated circuits today. Okay, let's get started. So if you read something about who Mark Horowitz is, you will find out that I'm a faculty member at Stanford. I've been there for a long time. I've won a bunch of awards. I started a company and I have a lot of three letter acronyms after my name, but that really doesn't say very much about who I am. In fact, it would be more apt to say, I'm still a kid. Okay, a very old kid, but a kid who takes everything that comes into his hands apart to learn how they work. And I do this to be able to create models of the world so I can use those models to reason about things moving forward. And that's very useful to do if you wanna be a circuit designer. And I'll talk more about the importance of models in a second. But I'm also someone who still worries about being able to live up to my reputation and worries about being an imposter. So if you feel often that maybe you don't belong, take some solace in the fact that even some of the people you really respect feel that way as well. Okay, to be a good circuit designer, you're gonna design something, which means you're gonna create a new object. Oftentimes creating that object is a set of trade-offs between various aspects of the object's characteristics. And so a good designer is able to optimize the overall objective that the, the device needs and be able to make the, the right trade-offs. Um, and in order to be able to do this kind of optimization, to think about the circuit, you really need to have the right kind of tools um, to use. So if you're thinking about a circuit design, in particular, a digital circuit design, you, you mostly have to worry about functionality. You want the circuit to do the right logical function. You care about its performance, how fast it's going to perform that function. And that's usually a combination of how much parallelism, how many things you can do in parallel, as well as what is the delay to get through that function. You also worry about how big that function is because there's a constraint and someone says you have to fit within some space or as you get it, make it bigger, it becomes more expensive to manufacture and that's not good. You want your parts to be cheap. And as I mentioned in today's designs, one of the most important or the most important characteristic is power. That is how much energy does it dissipate per second? Um, and that's often limited because of some thermal um, constraints in the system. And the other thing that's really important is how much energy does it take to do each of the operations that you want? And we'll see later that this energy per op is really the critical aspect in circuit design, digital circuit design today. Now, we usually talk about those four different objectives and managing those objectives. But in fact, the most important objective yet is not listed. And that is complexity or what I like to call designer sanity. You only have certain amount of brain juice. And if you are gonna use that brain juice, you wanna use it in a way that gives maximum return to you. So you don't wanna spend time optimizing things that don't matter very much. That is, you don't wanna make the, the solution or the circuit design overly complicated if you can use something that's simpler, go use it, because trust me, there will be enough tough problems for you to solve that you can't get around, and you want to save your time and effort for those things. Okay, so in the remaining part of this lecture, what I'd like to do is teach sort of three basic concepts. The first one is the importance of models, and models are the key tool that you have to reason about circuits. The next thing I want to do is I want to introduce a very simple model of a MOS transistor, which is usually called the switch resistor model. And it's excellent for understanding both the power and performance of, of MOS circuits. And in fact, its advantage is it's not that complicated, but it can do an amazing number of things. And the third thing I want to leave you with is um, an understanding of why optimizing the energy per operation is really what dominates the design of integrated circuits today. Okay, let's get started. Models are everything. In order to be able to reason about or even simulate on a computer something that you're interested in, a circuit that you're interested in, 
you'll need to have a model of it. That is, whether it's the wires that you have, which may have like lots of different sizes and layers, we're gonna need to be able to model those to be able to think about, well, how much power is that driving that wire gonna take or how much delay is it gonna add? And in addition, even though the transistors are very complicated in 3D structures right now, we don't really, when we're thinking about things, wanna worry about all those details. We wanna have something that we really can think about. And in fact, we can think about without having to use a computer to get some intuition for how to adjust things. Okay, and as Albert Einstein once said, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. And in fact, for us, we're really lucky that we can use very simple models, um, which really consist of only resistors and capacitors for all the elements that we have to deal with on our integrated circuit. And that's for digital integrated circuits. For analog integrated circuits, life gets a little bit more complicated. You need a little bit more complicated models. Okay, so if I have a wire, in my chip that's going from some gate over here to some gate over here, I have to model the characteristics of that wire. And in fact, that wire is gonna have some resistance, the, the metal has some resistance, and then each you know, part of the wire has capacitance as well. And so it's a distributed RC network. Now, if we're gonna model that RC network, the best way to model that RC network is usually what's called either a PI or T model. What you do is you take the resistance of the wire and you put half the capacitance on either end. And even though the capacitance is distributed along the wire, this model does a very good job of estimating what the delay through that wire is. Okay. Now, if you want even more accurate models, you can take this and put two of these back to back so the capacitance in the center doesn't become C wire over two. Well, it, be, it stays C wire over two. This becomes C wire over four. This becomes R wire over two. This becomes R wire over two. And this becomes C wire over four. Okay, that will give you a little better estimate, but it's surprising how, how accurate just a single segment can be for doing simple timing estimation. Now that models wires, which are one of the very important components on an integrated circuit. The other thing that we need to model are transistors. So the way we're gonna model a transistor is we're gonna model it as basically a switched resistor. So we're gonna take a transistor, this is an NMOS transistor. Okay, and we're gonna model that as having some transistor resistance, RT, and then there's parasitic capacitance, that's gonna be at the source and the drain. And then there's some gate capacitance, which is gonna be between the gate and the source. Now, the interesting thing with this model is it's very simple. Um, what we'll find out is the resistance of the transistor is proportional to some constant, which we'll call R square, okay? Times the length of the transistor divided by its width. So it's proportional to one over the width of the transistor. And then that resistance is also related to the power supply because the current that goes through the MOS transistor is roughly proportional to VDB minus VTH. I know people talk about quadratic models of transistors, but modern transistors, at least in digital circuits, are not quadratic, they're more linear. And so it scales as VDB over VDB minus VTH. And of course, the capacitance scales as the size of the capacitors. So the gate capacitance size scales as its width and the drain source drains scale as a width as well. Now, the great thing about this very simple model is we can basically understand almost all of digital circuit design using this very simple model. Okay, the last thing that we're gonna come back to at the end is the fact that the switch over here is not perfect. That is when it disconnects, it doesn't completely, its, it's resistance is not infinite, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, so now if I wanna calculate what the circuit delay is, and let's assume this wire is very short, so the resistance is not that big, so I just have a capacitor here. I can model this, remember, this inverter over here, I can model when it's pulling up as just a resistor to, to VDD, and that is gonna then drive some of the parasitic capacitance, the wire capacitance, and then it's also gonna drive 
the gate capacitance of the next gate. Okay, so we're going to have a simple RC circuit, and we can estimate the delay of this gate by simply the resistance of the transistor for this times the capacitance of the load it sees. Okay, now the great thing about this is that we can now very easily see how the delay of a, a CMOS gate is dependent on what's called the fan out. So if I look at what the input capacitance here is, and I'll call that CN, that's the gate capacitance of the transistors in that gate. And I look at the capacitance at this node, I'll call that C out. Okay. Notice that the delay, the resistance of this transistor is going to be proportional to one over the width. Okay, so the capacitance Cn is going to be equal to or proportional to the width, right? The resistance Rt is going to be proportional to one over the width, because as I make the transistors wider, the capacitance goes up, the resistance goes down. And so what we can see is that the size ratio between both of these, and if I multiply this times that, I'm going to get a product RC is going to be proportional to, C out is going to be proportional to the width of this one. Let's call that width two. We'll call this one width one. So it's going to be proportional to width two over width one. And because the capacitances are also proportional to the widths, we find out that the delay, the RC time constant, is related to basically the capacitance ratio of the input of the gate to the capacitance of the load that it sees. And I can talk much more about this, but the point is that that fan out is very important and you can estimate all the delays fairly accurately by just looking at the simple ratio. Okay, and even though the simple model doesn't have any effective input slope, one can extend the simple switch model with just a little addition um, to make that work. But I don't have time to do that. I also, I mean, there's great things you can talk about in, in circuits. You often have resistors and capacitors and then more resistors and capacitors. And if I was talking about how to estimate delay in circuits, we could talk a lot about this. The only thing I want to say here is the one thing, if you want to figure out the delay for some network like this, the one, oops, the one way to do that is to realize that the delay formula has to be right even if any of these components are zero. So if you write the formula, if, if there's only one capacitor, it'd be easy. We could figure out what the RC time constant is. So if we make C2 zero and then we make C1 zero and we add those two things together, that's actually gonna be the right delay um, for the whole circuit. But uh, I've, wasted, I've spent too much time, I, I have to move on. But there's lots of cool stuff that we can do there. Okay, what I really wanna focus on because it's the most important in, in integrated circuits today is to talk about power. Now, power in integrated circuits comes in two forms. There's dynamic power, which is the energy that's dissipated per unit work done. And then there's static power, which is basically just energy that you dissipate per unit time. Now, um, my first power crisis was in the, um, in the 80s, and that's um, BYWB, before you were born, probably for most people watching this video. But in that time, most of the technology that was used, NMOS, ECL, or TTL, all had some static power dissipation. And in that, during that period of time, power supplies were not scaling very much. And so what happened was we started to see powers increase and the power density that in the machines we were building were going up. Now, what's sort of interesting is that we got very worried when the power dense in watts per square centimeter got to be about 10. We're way past that now. But anyhow, when that happened, um, we decided we needed to do something to be more energy efficient. And the most thing, the most um, easy thing that we could do was to move to a technology that had very little static power dissipation. Okay. And that's when we went to CMOS technology. Because in CMOS technology, remember, we have the switched um, resistor model, and the PMOS transistors turn on when the voltages are zero and when the input voltage is, is low. 
and the NMOS transistors turn on when the input voltage is at VDD. And so by connecting those two transistors together, we have a circuit where it's impossible for both the NMOS and PMOS transistor to be on. And so what that says is I, I have a resistor that drives a capacitor, okay? But I have no, no path between the input and output. Okay, so the way we dissipate power in CMOS circuits is every time we charge or discharge the capacitor, we're gonna end up requiring some energy. Now, the thing is capacitors themselves don't dissipate any energy, they're a reactive element. So the energy must be dissipated through the resistor. Now, if you went to, to figure out how much power is dissipated through the resistor, we could do that by calculating the current through the resistor, and the voltage across the resistor because we know power is equal to I times V and you get a whole set of equations, but don't do that. Like I always think about whether there's a simpler way to figure out what the answer is. And I'm not really interested in exactly the power per unit time. I'm interested in how much energy did it take to change the output, okay? So I can look at energy instead and that leads to a much easier formulation. I know the amount of energy is Q times V. So if I take an amount of Q and I have to put it on a battery, it's gonna take me some energy, which is Q times V to get that charge on the top of the battery. Or similarly, if I take some charge out of the battery, it's gonna consume that much energy. So if I think about this, when the PMOS transistor is charging the capacitor up, it's taking some charge from the power supply and putting it on the capacitor. I know exactly how much charge that is. It's just equal to the, the change in the voltage in the capacitor, delta V times the capacitance. And generally speaking in CMOS circuits, delta V is equal to VDD. So it's CVDD, okay? Similarly, when I take the charge and then I discharge that node, okay, I'm not putting it back on the power supply. Like there's some clever ways that you can actually put it back on the power supply, but I'm not doing that. So that means, I ended up at the end of the cycle moving a unit of charge, which is equal to C VDD from VDD to ground. And that's gonna take an energy, which is basically C VDD, the charge that I moved times the voltage, which is VDD. Okay, so every time I make a a one to zero transition, I dissipate that much energy. Now, I have a brief aside here because this is a thing that drives me crazy with some of the students at Stanford. And I know you're all smarter than that. So just remember that when we talk about current flowing from the power supply to the capacitor, current flows always in a cycle, right? So what it's really doing is it's flowing from the power supply through the transistor into the top part of the capacitor that same current flows out of the bottom part of the capacitor and goes back to the power supply because current always has to flow in a cycle. Similarly, when I discharge that transistor, I have again, a loop of current. And again, that loop of current starts from the top, goes all the way around. So current always flows in a circle. Don't ever have current just going in one direction, not having it in a loop because that will drive me totally crazy and you don't want to make me crazy. All right, so as I was saying, for each zero, one, zero transition, it takes an energy, which is CV squared, okay? If the node doesn't transition, it doesn't take any energy at all. So if we let alpha be the average number of transitions a node does per cycle, or we could choose a different alpha, alpha for each node in the circuit, if we know what its simulation results are, um, then we can calculate the total power of the circuit because it's just the number of transitions, the energy per, per cycle, times the number of cycles per second, which is just the frequency of the clock, okay? And that leads to the, the very commonly stated power for CMOS circuits is one half CV squared F. Okay, so now we understand a little bit about power. Um, now, the next thing I wanna talk a little bit about is scaling and why scaling has led us into a kind of power conundrum. So scaling is often talked about both in terms of Moore's law that we scale technology and make it shorter and shorter. And then there are the scaling laws that Bob Denard talked about in 1974, which says if you scale MOS transistors in a particular way, 
you end up scaling both the voltages and the lengths. And so when you do that, the capacitance scales as the scaling factor. And interestingly, that R per square that I've been talking about is roughly constant. Now, what's interesting is that the C oxide R square in my formula and C parasitic roughly haven't changed very much over the 40 years that I've been doing design. You know, they've changed by integer factors, but the scaling factor is, is changed from three microns to about five nanometers. So that's a, like a three orders of magnitude change. And so these guys have only changed by a relatively small amount, which is the reason I like this parameterization of, of, of transistors. Okay, in any case, because of this, as I scale technology, each transistor gets smaller. So I get, um, like if I scale technology, they half the size it was before, then I get four times as many transistors, you know, in area, I get four times as many. Um, it turns out because the resistance is constant, but the capacitance is scaling down, the RC time constant scaled down as the scaling factor or as, as the capacitance, and it's capacitance scales as the scaling factor. Um, but what's really great is if you think about one half CV squared, if power supplies are scaling and C is scaling, the energy scales as a factor of A. And what that means is I can com compute um, eight times as many gate evaluations per second, and they're going faster and I have more gates. So by this, it says the energy per square millimeter should remain co relatively constant. And because of that, we have gotten used to the fact that the last years or you know, a couple of years ago, big computers can get scaled and fit on your wrist. In fact, the biggest computer when I was a student was the Cray-1. And you know, many years ago, I could have fit the entire Cray-1, which dissipated 100 kilowatts on a little piece of silicon that's about a couple millimeters on a side, and it would dissipate less than a lot, okay? And in fact, we often see the scaling of uh, processor performance um, going up and to the right, and this is an exponential scale indicating how technology scaling has worked. Now, unfortunately, um, there are little oopsies that happen. So if you look at actually the frequency of processors, of high performance processors, we were scaling frequency quite rapidly until basically the mid 2000s, at which point we kind of got stuck. And if you've noticed all processors that you've seen right now have been sitting somewhere between two and five gigahertz. And it hasn't really changed in the past uh, almost 20 years. Okay, well, why did processor frequency get stuck? Well, think about it, CV squared F. So one of the issues with power is F. Okay, the other thing that happened is if we look at actually the amount of power that's dissipated per square millimeter, okay, with processors, that was actually not being constant, but was scaling up. And then, in the early 2005s, it leveled off as we stopped scaling frequency, okay? And so why did that happen? Because I thought Denard scaling said that power density should be constant. Well, if you look on how fast we should have been scaling technology, um, we were a little greedy, okay? And we scaled performance faster than we should have. Well, the reason we did that is maybe we weren't, uh, and, and by 2005, we were about 10 times higher frequency than we should have been. Well, maybe we weren't really greedy. Maybe we were really clever instead because what we realized as good designers is that people didn't care too much about the power as long as they could cool it cheaply, but they did care a lot about performance. So what we did is we traded off power for performance because that's what people really wanted. Then we ran into this roadblock that you know people don't really want uh, you know uh, aircraft noises in their homes, so they can't have super fast fans, and you can't cool much above a hundred. Okay, so at least for home computers, that stopped. In in warehouses, people have gone to liquid cooling, and some people at home have gone to liquid cooling as well to try to get better performance. Okay, the problem is that this power problem is not going to go away. Because if we look at power supplies, power supplies have stopped scaling down. And the question is, why have power supplies stopped scaling down? And the answer is, our transistor switch isn't perfect. It actually leaks a little bit when it's off. So even when the VGS is below threshold, there is some leakage. 
to understand why we need a little bit more complicated model, but it has to do with energy carriers surmounting energy barriers and Fermi direct statistics and other things. But basically the bottom line is you get this exponential fall off of current to, in order to turn the transistor off. And as a result, as we were scaling power supply voltages and threshold voltages, we were getting to the point where the subthreshold power was starting to increase. Um, now, what's interesting is many people, you know, be, and it started in, increasing exponentially because as we scale the voltage, the current is exponential on that voltage. Now, many people said at the time, oh my God, subthreshold current or, you know, leakage current is going to dominate in future chips. And they often also said that the increased leakage current was a characteristic of scale technology, neither of which is true. What was true is we scaled threshold voltages because we did that, we could lower VDD and that improved the power, overall power of the chip. Like if the leakage power is really low and the dynamic power is large, if I increase the leakage current, I would be able to decrease VDD. Remember it's VDD over VDD minus VTH. So if I make VTH lower, I can make VDD lower and keep the effective resistance the same. Okay, so we as designers increase the leakage current. And that means that when we got to the point that the leakage current was getting to be an issue, we're gonna stop scaling. And as a result, voltages have stopped scaling as well. Okay, but what that means is that because of leakage, we can't scale VTHs. And because we can't scale VTHs, we can't scale VDDs. And if VDDs are not scaling, the energy per operation or per switch is not scaling very much, okay? And that's a big conundrum. And the reason that's a big problem is even though we have more transistors, okay? Think about it. The power that we dissipate is basically equal to, can be thought about as energy per op times ops per second, because that's energy per second, which is power. This is called performance. If we want performance to go up, this has to go down, okay? And as a result, all of our work today, and because power is constrained, we're, we're basically dissipating as much power as we can in most of the places we're in. We, in order to get the performance to continue to scale, we have to make the energy per op go down, okay? So hopefully I've taught you a little bit about models and a simple model and why with scaling today, which is understandable by the simple model, we need to decrease energy per op. So your job, which I hope you take, is to figure out clever ways of doing operations that basically reduce energy per operation. Thank you very much for your attention.